Travellers who've been offered a council property in Essex say they don't want it because giving up their caravan would cause them mental strain. John and Mary Flynn are facing eviction from an illegal pitch at Dale Farm near Basildon. They were offered a council-owned flat, but they want a plot of land instead. We shall, we shall not be moved. We shall, we shall not be moved. As the Dale Farm eviction gets ever closer, the protests continue, this time outside the county court in South End. It's yet another legal fight over Dale Farm near Basildon, the largest illegal traveller site in Europe. Some travellers here are officially homeless because they'll soon face eviction. Basildon Council has offered at least one couple alternative housing in a council flat. A lawyer is arguing that because they're travellers, that alternative accommodation, a council property, bricks and mortar, is unsuitable. He's arguing that because they're travellers, they should be offered a plot of land because it's more in keeping with their lifestyle. How difficult would it be for your father and mother to live in a bricks and mortar property? I think they'd be found dead within a week. I really would. I would think, I think it would be the hardest. It would be like taking their lifeline out. It would be like someone on life support and cutting off the machines. Why? Because they've never done that. They've lived in a caravan, a little 20 by, t by 8 foot caravan all their life. But the travellers' legal challenge is being contested by Basildon Council, which still plans to evict them. The hearing was adjourned until next month. Gareth George, BBC Look East. A former Essex cricketer has been charged with match fixing. It's claimed that Mervyn Westfield intentionally played below his best ability. Our sports reporter Kate Riley is in our newsroom now. Kate, how did this come to light? Well, this all relates to a match 12 months ago between Essex and Durham. It was a Pro 40 event and Essex eventually went on to win the match. And the bowler in this game was Mervyn Westfield. He's this man, 22 years old and from Romford in Essex. Now, back in May this year, he was one of two players arrested on suspicion of match irregularities. The other player, Denise Canaria, last week was cleared of any wrongdoing. Mr. Westfield, though, today was charged with one count of conspiracy to defraud. He's accused of bowling his first over dishonestly. This allowed the scoring of a certain number of runs in this match. Has Essex County Cricket Club said anything today, then? Well, they've issued us with this statement, and it reads like this. We are very saddened by the news that Mervyn has been charged by Essex Police. They added they weren't privy to any of this evidence, and that's why no action was taken by the club. No one from the club was prepared to come on camera tonight. Mr Westfield is still employed by the club, and he will be until the end of this month. They say his contract has been terminated, though down to pure cricketing reasons. The bowler was charged today at Rayleigh Police Station and next week is due in court in front of magistrates in London. Kate, okay, thank you very much. A man has been jailed for eight years for raping a woman in her 70s in Harlow. David Catton, who lives in Bishop Stortford, has also been placed on the sex offenders register. The woman had been walking home after shopping in May when the attack took place. The police in Essex have been making house-to-house -house inquiries after a man was shot in his front garden. It happened in the village of West Hanningfield last week. Nobody was hurt he was shot at, but it's being treated as attempted murder. Officials say a major campaign in Suffolk to improve student performance is starting to bear fruit after years of decline. Extra government money has been used to target schools which are struggling. Colin Tapscott is at the sharp end when it comes to driving up the performance of pupils. Hello, you all right? He took over as head at Gusford School in Ipswich three years ago. He has more than 500 pupils and says the key in terms of attainment is to monitor every one of them incredibly closely. We assess uh, children throughout the school uh, from when they start through, right through so they go to the end. So we don't leave it to suddenly waiting towards the end and thinking, oh dear, we've, we've not quite made it. If they're struggling with areas, we make sure that we target that improvement. One to start with, you end up with a six. What other numbers go together? Officials admit that levels of attainment have been slipping across Suffolk for some time, but they believe that with extra government cash helping fund intensive support for struggling schools, the tide is starting to turn. 
sometimes it does mean quite painful decisions and it hurts the body of that school. We were talking about it being a family earlier on. It, 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 yeah, it's hurtful when someone comes along to your family saying you're not doing this right. But that's the bottom line because we know we can get those standards up because we've seen it can do it in other places. But that injection of extra money was only for a limited time. Given the current financial squeeze, can this intensive support be sustained? It's a question unions want answered. This is where we are at the moment. Where we go in the future depends very much on government funding. Now, from a Suffolk perspective, we are seeing the advisory service cut drastically. And if we're going to have those sorts of cutbacks, what does that mean for the future attainment in Suffolk? At Gusford Primary, at least, they have found a way to drive up standards of writing and numeracy. It's a model others are now keen to follow. Kevin Birch, BBC Look East. And there's more on that on The Politics Show on BBC One at the later time of 2.25 on Sunday afternoon. Delegates at the TUC conference have unanimously voted to support the Connaught workers facing the sack. There's hope some of the 300 or so workers in Norwich who've lost their jobs can be re-employed with other contractors. The TUC's governing council says it will lobby the government to try to secure long-term employment for affected staff. A group of business leaders from the East delivered a petition to Downing Street today. They were trying to persuade the government to keep investing in this region and to keep the regional development agency. 100,000 signatures have been collected as part of a campaign called Blueprint for Growth. It's calling on the coalition to work with businesses across East Anglia. for his much-awaited visit, but what is life like as a Catholic in this country in 2010? Well, over the next two days, we'll try to find out. Today we hear from the youngest priest in England who works in Peterborough. My name is Father Michael Collis, and I was ordained a priest on the 10th of July this year. The visit of the Holy Father for me, I think, will be an encouragement. It will be an opportunity for, for me to gather with other Catholics from all over the country. I really love being a priest. Um, it's a, a great privilege. There's a lot to learn, though. I mean, it's such a busy parish. There's so many different processes in place. And lots of forms to learn how to fill in. And obviously, thousands of names to remember. Hi, Frank. Good to Good see you. How, how are you keeping? Very well, thank you. Good. People are so welcoming and they let you into their lives. Do you rest all right? You looked really oh, tired yesterday. No, no problem at all. I just it's agree. really quite overwhelming sometimes how, uh, how open people are to you. This is called a cincture. And um, as we put it on, we say a prayer for the grace of purity. Obviously, there have been some terrible things happen, which mean that the church... Um, can't expect people to respect it um, as perhaps it did in the, in the past, which was wrong anyway, but now we have to um, be ready with you know, real answers for people about why we believe what we believe, why the church teaches what it teaches. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That was good. It was all right, wasn't it? Still nerve-wracking, wise. <laughs> is that I think people just need something encouragement and just just to know that actually it's it's fine to keep to the church's um, <laughs> the teaching that the church has treasured for two thousand years. Father Michael Collis. Well, the.